this uh, book talk. Great pleasure to introduce Max Boot, uh, who has uh, been here for previous book talks in, in our previous location. Max is a senior fellow at Council on Foreign Relations, uh, one of the country's leading experts on uh, warfare. Uh, his last book, Invisible Armies, was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and he is going to introduce some of the big themes and stories of this book. Right after somebody takes that call. <laughs> right after we hang up that call. And then we'll take, we'll have, we'll open it to a discussion. Everyone, uh, glad to be at the New America. Um, and happy to talk about my book, which is also a, I'm happy to say, a New York Times bestseller, uh, in spite of not being attacked by President Trump. Uh, it achieved the honor all on its own. And the, uh, the subject of my book is uh, this man, uh, Edward Lansdale, who is certainly one of the most uh, unconventional generals in the history of the U.S. Air Force, or probably any other military service as well. You know, somebody's really eager to call in and talk to us. Uh, I think we should take the call. <laughs> Yeah, it might be Trump. They're not going away. I mean, let's get them involved in the dialogue. Very insidious. It's a competing. It's a competing publisher calling to sabotage my book talk. Borrow the mouse so I can mute. There we go. Very small. Can you? Sorry. No, you gotta roll with the punches. <laughs> there we go. What? There's nothing. <laughs> okay, so is that somebody calling in? Yes, but I don't, there's nobody invited to call in or anything okay. like that. Right. Yeah, I'm just going to turn the sound off. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, where was I? One of the more unconventional. Yes, very unconventional presentation and a very unconventional <laughs> subject. Uh, let's see, is this thing actually working now? Hmm. It's muted as well as locked, I would say. This thing doesn't, I, I can't seem to control it from here though. Okay, maybe now it's working. Is it working? He just used that, he should be good. Use this. Okay. All right. Why do you come up here then? <laughs> that's a novel. That's a novel idea. I, I don't quite know what to do with this microphone. It, I think is, the is this working? Yeah, it's for the live, it's for the live stream. Oh, okay. So, 
All right, on with our show. Um, Edward Lansdale, one of the more uh, unconventional uh, general officers in the history of the U.S. Air Force or really any other military service. Uh, he was said to be the model for both uh, the quiet American and the ugly American. Uh, he's been written about by every major author on the subject of the Vietnam War, sometimes in laudatory terms, sometimes not so laudatory. Uh, if you go online, you'll even see a burgeoning conspiracy industry uh, which fingers him as the mastermind of the John F. Kennedy assassination, uh, based largely on, in fact, entirely on this photo, which taken in Dallas on November 22, 1963, which shows somebody uh, from the back walking by a, a pair of tramps and, a, and two police officers. And based on this uh, somewhat flimsy foundation, uh, he has been widely accused of uh, masterminding the murder of a president. In fact, this was the basis of Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. Uh, so there are obviously a lot of myths and legends about Ed Lansdale, and I would quote to you from the words of one of his bureaucratic rivals in the Pentagon in the early 60s, General Brute Krulak of the U.S. Marine Corps, who said there are few angels in my knowledge more damned and at the same time applauded. History is going to have to portray Lansdale's real part. And well, that's where I come in, uh, because I am the voice of history, having devoted the last five years of my life uh, to studying the life and times of Ed Lansdale. So who was Ed Lansdale beyond the myths, beyond the legends? Who was the real man? Well, he was born in 1908. Um, I guess I don't actually have a laser pointer, but he is uh, in the middle of this photo uh, with his parents and, and his brothers, uh, born in 1908 in Detroit. Uh, he was not to the manor born. Uh, he was not one of the uh, Ivy League and Wall Street aristocrats who created U.S. foreign policy after World War II. He was a middle-class kid. His dad was an automotive executive at a time when the automobile industry was just starting, so a lot of his employers went out of business, often while he was working for them. Uh, Lansdale, born in Detroit, but spent most of his childhood in L.A. and California, uh, became a quintessential Californian, very laid back, very easygoing, hated bureaucracy, hated regimentation, uh, hated neckties. Uh, in fact, a kind of a proto-Silicon Valley guy decades before the formation of Silicon Valley. A couple other points worth bringing out very briefly about his upbringing. One is that he was not a great student, and his life should give hope to see students everywhere. Uh, but he was a great reader and, and loved reading about the founding, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence. And those would be the ideals that would inspire him as an American envoy in Asia. Other point to mention briefly is that, uh, let's see, is this thing going to turn? There it is. Uh, the other point to mention briefly is that he grew up at a time of virulent racism, especially in California against Asian Americans, and he was never contaminated by that kind of prejudice. He always treated everybody of whatever race or ethnicity as being entirely equal human beings, uh, in part, I think, because he was kind of a, uh, a minority himself, even though he was a white middle class. American, uh, his family were also Christian scientists, and this was a religious uh, group that was very small and very frowned upon uh, in his day, and so he had identified with outsiders and outcasts. This would also be one of the secrets of his success in Asia, is that he would not condescend to the Asians that he met. He would treat them on an entirely equal level, which was pretty unusual for Westerners in those days. Uh, so... Um, Hmm. Well, let's see. Can I get this thing to turn? Maybe not. Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, Lansdale uh, graduated, uh, or did not graduate, from uh, UCLA. He actually dropped out a few credits shy of graduation in the early 30s at the height of the Great Depression and moved to New York, hoping to become a New Yorker writer or cartoonist did not quite make it, and instead moved back to California and went into advertising. And this is him uh, with his colleagues at an ad agency in San Francisco, circa 1940. That's Lansdale in the middle with his uh, head down, looking at some uh, at an ad. Um, and this is one of the ads that, uh, that his ad agency did. He's actually, it's a little hard to see there, but he's up, up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, his life, like the life of the entire country, was up upended on December 7th, 1941. Uh, he was eager to get into the fight, but found it hard to do so. He was over age. Uh, 
and uh, had tr and had some medical issues that made the army reluctant to take him back. So instead of uh, joining the army, he joined the OSS, America's first civilian intelligence agency. He spent the war years stateside uh, interviewing travelers about the strange and wondrous places from North Africa to the Pacific, where Allied troops would shortly be landing. In the course of doing that, he showed himself to be a very skilled listener, somebody who was very good at eliciting information from, from the people that he met. Well, uh, by the fall of 1945, as uh, millions of American GIs uh, were returning home from the war, uh, Lansdale uh, went abroad on his first permanent overseas deployment to the Philippines, uh, where he was sent by, the, by now he was an Army intelligence officer and would shortly get into the Air Force. This is him in the middle on this leaky rice boat that he used to explore a bunch of the newly liberated Japanese islands. He was fascinated by everything that he found about him in, in the Philippines, uh, the food, the culture, the economic conditions. He wanted to learn as much as he could, and he was especially fascinated by this burgeoning uh, communist insurgency known as the Hook Rebellion. Uh, this is Lansdale in the middle of the picture back row uh, with a bunch of uh, captured hooks, H-U-K, uh, the communist rebels who were challenging the Philippine government beginning in the mid-1940s. Uh, and uh, Lansdale was, was, was trying to, to find out as much about them as he could. Now, by this time, uh, Lansdale uh, was already married. In 1933, he'd married this woman, uh, Helen, who was a small-town girl from upstate New York. Uh, but when he went to the Philippines in 1945, he met this woman, uh, Pat Kelly, who was a very vivacious Filipina. Uh, her last name came from her late husband, who had died during the war, who was of Irish Filipino ancestry. She was a single mother, a working mother. She was a journalist and later would have a long career working for the U.S. Information Agency in Manila. And she was initially of interest to Lansdale uh, because she was from the same part of Luzon province as many of the, uh, of the uh, Hook rebels. In fact, she had gone to high school with some of them. And uh, so Lansdale enlisted her on these uh, very dangerous forays into the backcountry of Luzon to meet with the Hooks. And in the course of these adventures, a friendship developed and before long a romance. And uh, Pat Kelly would become the great love of his life something that was not generally known before uh, I wrote this book, and I found out an awful lot about their relationship uh, thanks to the next slide, which, there it is, uh, thanks to the love letters that they shared with one another over the course of many years. And I got very lucky in the course of my research because I tracked down uh, Pat Kelly's granddaughter, who actually lives here in Northern Virginia. She invited me over to her house and said, hey, would you be interested in these letters that I have in my basement? Uh, and I said, boy, would I? Uh, and so I got access to this vast correspondence, and then I also met with Lansdale's boys, who are now in their 60s and 70s, living in Florida and New York, and they shared with me the letters that he wrote to their mother, Helen. And so I'm the first person after Lansdale himself to have read both sets of letters, often written simultaneously. And I also got access to a lot of newly declassified documents. And so this, this gave me a vantage point into Lansdale's life that nobody else uh, has ever had before, at least no writer has ever had before. Very, very interesting. I mean, I learned things about him, for example, the importance of, of Pat Kelly for him, not only personally, but also professionally, because she was incredibly important in serving as an entry point for him into Philippine culture and really understanding the Philippines in a way that it's very hard for outsiders to do. And of course, in the during my research, I also learned of some of the more awkward episodes in uh, Lansdale's life. For example, what happened in 1947, when his wife Helen and boys Ted and Pete came to live with him in Manila at the same time that he was still, of course, seeing Pat Kelly. And this became one of the more audacious uh, covert operations in the secret agent's life to, to juggle these two women simultaneously. Uh, he actually asked his wife for a divorce, which she did not grant, uh, and they stayed married. But he would spend most of the next decade in Asia, and so she became, in effect, a single mother living here in Washington, actually over on MacArthur Boulevard, appropriately enough. Uh, raising uh, their two sons. Uh, now, this initial uh, Lansdale deployment to the Philippines from 1945 to 1948 was very important because it set the stage for what happened next. This, the, the Philippines would become the site of its first great success, uh, which began in 1950 at a very dark time for the United States. Uh, the Korean War was raging. Uh, the communists had just taken power in China. 
the Soviet Union had just acquired the atomic bomb. McCarthyism was on the upsurge in this town. Uh, and there were great fears in Washington that the Philippines was going to be the next country to fall to the communists, and led by this man, Louis Tarouk, uh, who was the leader of the Hooks. Well, uh, there were no troops to spare to send to the Philippines. Otherwise, they might have been dispatched uh, because, of, of course, of the Korean War. And so instead of sending troops, the decision was made at the CIA uh, to send Ed Lansdale and a small team of covert operatives. And their mission was nothing less than to defeat the Hook Rebellion. This is Lansdale in his bungalow in Manila in 1950. That's him at the head of the table. On the right is his good friend Robert Chaplin of The New Yorker uh, sitting at the other end of the table. His back to us is Bo Bohannon, his very eccentric deputy and anthropologist. And to the left of them, uh, to, the, to our left, are a bunch of the Filipinos with whom he worked. And this was very emblematic of the Lansdale uh, uh, approach. He was very uh, very casual, very laid back. He didn't believe in, in formal meetings with agendas and protocol. He believed in these coffee clutches, kind of brainstorming around a table in a very informal manner uh, and thus generating the ideas that would actually defeat the Hook Rebellion. The most important thing that he did was to meet and cultivate this man, Ramon Magsaysay, who was then the newly appointed defense minister of the Philippines, a former guerrilla fighter against the Japanese, an honest, uh, well-meaning guy, but he didn't really know how to defeat the Hook Rebellion, and so Lansdale, in effect, became his one-man brain trust. And uh, Lansdale and Magsaysay traveled across uh, the Philippines together, and together they developed what would today be called counterinsurgency doctrine. Lansdale's essential insight was that uh, the way to, defeat the, to defeat the insurgents was by using less force rather than more. Uh, he understood that it was counterproductive for the Philippine army to be bombarding barrios with artillery, uh, which wound up killing a lot of civilians and, and, and uh, creating more enemies than it eliminated. And so he counseled the Philippine army to, to be more restrained in the application of violence, to treat the population better, and to treat them as brothers. And once the people would trust the army, uh, they would then rat out the insurgents in their midst uh, to the military forces. This is, you know, basically... Uh, coin 101, but at the time the word counterinsurgency did not exist, and Lansdale was a pioneer uh, in this approach. Uh, now remember, of course, that he was also a former ad man, and so he loved psychological warfare, uh, which is the military version of advertising. And he knew a lot about the folklore of the Philippines, and he knew about these legends about the Aswang, these vampires that were said to haunt the Philippine countryside. And so he decided to mobilize the Aswang against the Hooks. And he did this by having a Philippine army unit puncture a couple of holes uh, into the neck of a, of a dead hook fighter and then spread the tale that he had been killed by one of these Aswang vampires, thereby putting the fear of the supernatural uh, into, into the enemy fighters. This became a, a big part of the legend, uh, but I don't want to suggest that he defeated the hooks through these kinds of dirty tricks or, or psychological gambits. He really did it by focusing on politics. Uh, because he understood that the Hook's basic appeal was in their slogan, which was bullets, not ballots. And why bullets, not ballots? Because people could not trust the ballots. The elections were rigged. Uh, and so Lansdale understood he had to give the people confidence in their political system, which he did by enlisting Filipino civic organizations to safeguard the balloting. But his masterpiece was getting Magsaysay Sai elected president of the Philippines in 1953. Lansdale, on behalf of the CIA, became... Uh, Mog Saisai's virtual campaign manager. He, for example, came up with this campaign slogan, which was, Mog Saisai is my guy. And so uh, Mog Saisai became known throughout the Philippines as the guy. And so thanks to Lansdale's expert political advice and to uh, Mog Saisai's own accomplishments and personality, he was elected in a landslide. And this is him getting inaugurated as president at the end of 1953. And this was the, the death blow for the hooks because seeing that you had this honest reformer in office. Uh, they decided there was no point in continuing the struggle anymore. They could seek redress of their grievances uh, through the political uh, process. And so when Lansdale returned home, uh, he became uh, the fair-haired boy of Alan Dulles, the CIA director. That's Dulles on the far left, uh, Lansdale next to him. Uh, by this point, Lansdale had acquired a new nickname. He became known as Landslide Lansdale. Uh, for his achievement in the Philippines. And this became quite important when a crisis in another Southeast Asian country erupted in 1954. And that was 
the year of the uh, French defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. This was a photo, by the way, that I took at the uh, very interesting museum uh, that now sits at Dien Bien Phu. So if you happen to find yourselves in northern Vietnam, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, but there was, of course, great panic in Washington in 1954 about uh, the fall of the French Empire and the possibility that Ho Chi Minh and the Communists would take over all of Indochina. Uh, you then had the Geneva Conference, which split Vietnam into two. You had created northern Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh, but South Vietnam was supposed to be a non-communist state, but nobody quite knew how do you create this non-communist state out of nothing. And just Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, were talking about these problems not far from here. They decided, well, why don't we send Ed Lansdale out to the Vietnam and see what he can do? And so it was in the summer of 1954 that Ed Lansdale arrived in Saigon, uh, and his marching orders from Alan Dulles were quite literally, do what you did in the Philippines. And he did. Uh, the first thing that he did was to find a new protege uh, to cultivate. As he had cultivated Mog Sai Sai in the Philippines, he cultivated No Din Ziem, who's in the center of this photo, uh, this Catholic Confucian Mandarin who was just appointed prime minister of the new state of South Vietnam. Uh, very few people imagine that ZM would last nine weeks, much less nine years in power. Uh, the fact that he managed to accumulate power and, and, to, and to stay in office owes a lot to the guidance that he received from Ed Lansdale. And Ed Lansdale cultivated him very carefully. That's, uh, that's uh, Mog Sai, uh, sorry, that's ZM on the right side of the photo, and that's Lansdale in the middle. Uh, now, there was some, it was much harder to cultivate ZM than it had been with Mog Sai Sai for various issues, including the fact that ZM and Lansdale literally did not speak the same language, because although Lansdale had a real talent for cultivating foreign leaders, uh, he was a typical American in that he only spoke English. And this was not so much from the Philippines, where the elites spoke English. It was a bigger problem in Vietnam, uh, where they spoke Vietnamese or French. And so he had to work through a translator. But even working through a translator, he cultivated a very close relationship with ZM. And how did he do it? Very simple. He listened rather than lectured. Instead of laying down the law, as Americans are wont to do, he showed great patience in hearing ZM out. This was not easy to do because ZM was a notorious windbag uh, who was famous for going on for hour after hour and boring the pants off of most of his American interlocutors. Uh, but Lansdale was made of sterner stuff and probably had a stronger bladder uh, because he would sit there hour after hour listening to ZM drone on and at the end of that time, he would say, well, that's fascinating, Mr. Prime Minister. If I understand what you're saying, it's X, Y, and Z. And then he would rephrase what ZM had told him, putting across his own ideas as if ZM had thought of him himself. <laughs> A very effective method of operating, by the way. It works. I would recommend it. It works with bosses. It works with spouses. Uh, it definitely <laughs> works with foreign heads of state. <laughs> and so that was a method by which Lansdale won ZM's confidence and enlisted his support to carry out his full pacification agenda for South Vietnam, which included uh, Operation Passage to Freedom, enlisting the U.S. Navy to move 900,000 refugees from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, thereby greatly strengthening the state of South Vietnam. And of course, Lansdale being Lansdale, he, there had to be a psychological warfare component to this. Uh, for example, hiring a soothsayer uh, to predict bad fortune for North Vietnam and good <laughs> fortune for South Vietnam. He brought over Filipino doctors and nurses to provide free medical care in South Vietnam to get people to support the government. This was done under the auspices of an supposedly independent Filipino organization called Operation Brotherhood, but of course it was all sponsored and paid for by Lansdale and the CIA. Now, not, not everybody in the U.S. government fully approved or approved at all of what Lansdale was doing, and among the skeptics, whoops, was his own boss, General Lightning Joe Collins, one of the great heroes of World War II four-star general who had fought in both the Pacific and European theaters of operation, former Army Chief of Staff who was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Saigon by his friend, President Eisenhower. And, uh, you know, Collins was a great conventional general, but he did not have the mindset for a counterinsurgency in Southeast Asia, and so he and Lansdale clashed from the very start. Their very first country team meeting, uh, Collins was going on about his plans to reduce the size of the South Vietnamese Army, uh, because he thought it was too expensive. Well, Lansdale descended. He said, no, we need a, a substantial army because it's the only part of the government that works. And the Viet 
recommend the communists are going to pull out of a bunch of areas in the countryside, so we have to provide some governance to them, and the army is the only instrument of the state that can actually do that. Plus, there's all these independent sect armies running around. You can't have uh, private armies. You have to have a unified force, so you have to demobilize the militia fighters and incorporate them into the army. Well, Collins listened to Lansdale a little bit and then said, you know, I am here as the personal representative of the President of the United States, and I've heard enough. Have a seat. Well, at this point, most colonels, when told to have a seat by a four-star general, would indeed have a seat. But Lansdale was not your average colonel. He was an inveterate American troublemaker. So instead of sitting down, he stood up and said, well, sir, you may be here as the representative of the President of the United States, but I'm convinced that if the people of the United States could hear what you have to say, they would disagree with you. <laughs> and on behalf of the people of the United States, I'm walking out on you. <laughs> and out he walked out the door. Now, don't try this at home. Most people will not survive this kind of insubordination. Uh, the fact that Lansdale did manage to get away with it is a, uh, is a sign that he had a patron more powerful than a four-star general uh, because he had the full support of Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, who were the kingmakers in Washington uh, in the 1950s. And their support enabled him to run roughshod of General Collins, which became of great importance in the spring of 1955 during the pivotal episode in the uh, ZM's uh, consolidation of power, the Battle of Saigon, when ZM sent the South Vietnamese army into the streets of Saigon to battle these uh, sect militia forces. And it was a real street fight for in, in touch and go for a while. And uh, General Collins wanted to abandon ZM. So Lansdale went over his head straight to Alan Dulles, and Alan Dulles got President Eisenhower to overrule his ambassador. Thus, ZM maintained U.S. support and able to consolidate power in South Vietnam. So by the end of 1956, uh, ZM appeared to be firmly entrenched in power. Here he is touring a area of the provinces pacified at Lansdale's uh, direction. Uh, Lansdale finally left Vietnam at the end of 1956, returned to Washington to a senior policy post at the Pentagon, and the general feeling at the time was that ZM, like Mok Tsai Tsai, was this great nationalist hero in Asia, this bulwark against communist expansionism. And, uh, of course, among those in the know with, this, with the uh, very uh, top-level security clearance, uh, they knew who was, uh, or they knew who was truly really responsible for DM's success, and that was, of course, uh, Colonel Lansdale. And here he is getting a medal from Vice President Nixon as his wife, Helen, looks on. Uh, by the late 1950s, Lansdale was becoming one of the least secret, secret agents on the planet. He was actually pretty famous. He was said to be the model of Graham Greene's The Quiet American. Uh, he was definitely the model for uh, one of the main positive characters in The Ugly American. And he was acquiring all sorts of nicknames like the American James Bond and the T. Lawrence of Asia, as well as, of course, Landslide Lansdale. Uh, when the Kennedy administration came into power, they were quite enamored of, of, of uh, Lansdale. But ultimately, Lansdale's uh, legend would prove his undoing because the Kennedys, in fact, uh, uh, came to uh, entrust him with a task that he could not possibly accomplish, and that was to deal with their uh, top-level objective, the overthrow of Fidel Castro. Uh, the Kennedy administration had begun with the catastrophe of the Bay of Pigs, and the Kennedys were determined to avenge this uh, debacle, this insult, by getting rid of Castro. Uh, whether uh, killing him, overthrowing him, they didn't care. They just wanted him gone. But they had no confidence in the CIA, which had botched the Bay of Pigs and which uh, Lansdale had opposed. And so instead of entrusting the agency to get rid of Castro, they decided to entrust the American James Bond. And so at the end of 1961, Lansdale became operations director of Operation Mongoose, this interagency effort to topple Castro. Well, he very quickly determined that the only way you're going to get rid of Castro in short order was with an American military invasion. Uh, but the Kennedys did not want to invade Cuba. They wanted some kind of covert action gimmick that would enable them to get rid of Castro at no risk to themselves. And so Lansdale would spend much of 1962 trying to provide that covert action gimmick. And the result was, uh, well, I'll show you the result if the slide will turn. There it is. This was one of the results. This was uh, Gusano Libra, the, the mascot of the uh, Cuban rebellion as concocted by the artist at the CIA, and this is 
free worm uh, because uh, Castro called his enemies worms, and so this was an attempt to turn that moniker against him. And this is a propaganda leaflet showing free worms sabotaging power lines in Cuba. Well, you have to admit this is undoubtedly the cutest mascot that any insurgency has ever had, uh, but it was not very successful. <laughs> the only thing that uh, Operation Mongoose achieved was to generate the intelligence that alerted uh, policymakers in Washington that uh, Nikita Khrushchev was emplacing nuclear missiles into, into Cuba. After the conclusion of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, Operation Mongoose was disbanded, and uh, Lansdale lost the favor of the Kennedys and was left essentially defenseless before his many bureaucratic enemies, of whom the most important was his own boss, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Now, McNamara and Lansdale were like oil and water. McNamara, of course, came over to the Pentagon from having run the Ford Motor Company, graduate of the Harvard Business School, and in all fairness, I should mention also of my alma mater, UC Berkeley, uh, a guy who was enamored of numbers, of systems analysis, uh, brilliant on some level. Lansdale, on the other hand, of course, was not so academically accomplished, UCLA dropout, uh, but he had spent some years in Southeast Asia, and so when McNamara took office at the beginning of 1961, Lansdale sought to begin his education uh, in the kind of war that was just beginning in South Vietnam. And Lansdale had just returned from South Vietnam. He brought some captured weaponry with him from the Viet Cong, some rusty rifles and, and pistols and spears and so forth, all caked in mud and blood, and walked into McNamara's office and dumped this, these weapons on McNamara's immaculate desk. And he said, Mr. Secretary, these are the weapons that are being used by our enemies in Vietnam. They're not very sophisticated, and the people using them, you wouldn't even recognize them as soldiers, but they think of themselves that way. And they are, in fact, licking the troops on our side who are armed with all the best equipment that the U.S. Army can provide because they have the power of an ideal. They have the power of an idea. And the only way we're going to defeat them is if we give the troops on our side, the South Vietnamese, the power of, of an even greater ideal. We're not going to bomb this revolution into oblivion. Well, in hindsight, pretty wise advice, but McNamara was invincibly armored in his ignorance and arrogance and ignored what Ed Lansdow had to say. And so as, as the situation in South Vietnam reached a crisis point in 1963, Lansdale was entirely sidelined from U.S. policymaking. In 1963 was the year of the Buddhist crisis. You had the militant Buddhists rising up against CM. You had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire in the streets of Saigon. This convinced the Kennedy administration that the only way to stop communism in uh, in Indochina was to overthrow ZM uh, because they thought that ZM had lost the support of the population. Now Lansdale argued in vain against this. He said, I know ZM, I have the generals, and ZM is imperfect, but he's the least bad alternative that we have, and I can work with them. Uh, the generals, on the other hand, if, uh, are going to be far more corrupt, less legitimate, less of so please don't overthrow ZM. Well, they didn't listen to him, and at the beginning of November 1963, ZM was, in fact, overthrown and killed along with his brother uh, on the very same day when Lansdale was being retired from the Pentagon as a two-star general. And the consequences of the coup were every bit as disastrous as Lansdale had predicted. The Viet Cong stepped up their infiltrations. South Vietnam all but disintegrated. You had military coup following military coup. And so that by 1965, Lyndon Johnson decided he had no choice but to bomb North Vietnam and to send American combat troops into South Vietnam in order to preserve its independence. This was the last thing that Lansdale ever wanted to see. He wanted to save South Vietnam, but he thought that the South Vietnamese should be on the front line themselves, that we could provide advice and support, but we should not be doing the fighting for them. He was ignored. He went back to Vietnam in 1965 uh, to try to help working at the U.S. Embassy. That's him in the middle arriving in, at Saigon at the airport. Uh, he worked, went to work for this man, Henry Cabot Lodge, the U.S. ambassador in Saigon, who was not a happy relationship because Lodge had also been the ambassador in 1963, who had overseen the overthrow and murder of Lansdale's friend, No Din Ziem. Now, in the past, in the 1950s, Lansdale had no problem running roughshod over mere ambassadors. Uh, he did not have quite that same power in the 1960s. Uh, the problem was that he no longer had patrons as powerful as the Dulles brothers in Washington. And there we go. Uh, his chief patron in the 1960s was Vice President Hubert Humphrey, whom you can see on the left of this uh, photo. Uh, Humphrey was quite uh, taken with Lansdale.
Bill, but he was almost powerless to affect President Johnson's calculations in the Vietnam War. Lansdale also tried to cultivate local protégés, and he tried to work with Win Cao Key, seen on the right of this photo, this very flashy Air Force vice marshal, who was uh, prime minister and then vice president of South Vietnam. But Key lost a power struggle with Win Van Tu, another general who became the dominant strongman of the military junta. And so in the mid-1960s, Lansdale lacked both a powerful preacher in Washington and a powerful protege on the ground in South Vietnam. And so he became largely a spectator as the American war effort careened along its conventional course. General William Westmoreland genuinely thought that he could kill the Viet Cong faster than they could be replaced. Lansdale consistently argued against this illusion. He said the only way you're going to win is by creating a stable, legitimate, and popular government in South Vietnam that the people can support. He was ignored. Finally, the wisdom of his insights became undeniable uh, after the Tet Offensive, which uh, broke out 50 years ago. Uh, Lansdale had warned against it, that a, an offensive was coming, and he very quickly saw that while Westmoreland was claiming it was a great victory, it was in fact a crippling psychological blow that destroyed American popular support for the war effort. So when he went home from Vietnam for the final time in the summer of 1968, he was feeling very much dejected, defeated, and demoralized because he understood that the war was being lost, and he was not terribly surprised when in 1975, North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam and very quickly destroyed the husk of a state. Now, the question I raise in my book, The Road Not Taken, is what would have happened if Lansdale had been listened to? What if his road had been the one that we had taken? Well, I certainly can't sit here today and say that we would have necessarily prevailed, that South Vietnam would still exist, because no matter what we did, North Vietnam was going to be a formidable adversary with more will to win than the United States had. But at the very least, what I can say with, with some certitude is that if Lansdale had been listened to, we would not have lost 58,000 Americans in the jungles of Vietnam. We would not have had millions of Vietnamese killed in the crossfire uh, because he never wanted to see this conventional big unit war in the first place. And so I think this was a tragedy of history that he was ignored. And it's something that he himself felt very keenly to the end of his days. He was tortured by the might have, might have been and what ifs uh, of his career. So, while his professional life obviously did not have a very happy ending, he did find some personal happiness. Uh, after his first wife died in 1972, uh, Pat Lee, who was still unmarried and had just retired from the U.S. Embassy in Manila, moved uh, to Washington, and the two old lovebirds married on July 4th of 1973. This is them in the kitchen of their house in uh, northern Virginia. And they lived happily ever after until Lansdale's own death from natural causes in 1987. And it was a very moving experience for me to visit his grave at Arlington National Cemetery because after five years of studying the guy, I felt like I really knew him. In fact, probably more in some ways than I know my own father, which may be a commentary on my relationship with my father, but also a relationship <laughs> on my, a commentary on my uh, in-depth study of Ed Lansdale. And so, uh, you know, I tried to tell his story and to do justice to it and took directions I did not fully expect. I mean, I knew this was going to be the story of the Vietnam War, but it was also developed as an adventure story, a spy story, and most surprising of all, a romance, and, and a very touching romance between Ed Lansdale and, and Pat Kelly. The final point that I would make is I think this story, uh, while intrinsically interesting, and I hope a good read, uh, also I think has some relevance for the present day, because we are engaged in another great counterinsurgency today, this time not against Islam, not against uh, communist insurgents as in Lansdale's day, but against Islamist insurgents. And how are we going to win the war on terror? Well, I would submit probably not with mass numbers of American ground troops. Uh, we've been there, done that, tried it, didn't like it very much, probably not going to do it again anytime soon. So if we're not going to win American ground troops, how are we going to win? Well, I think uh, if we do win, it'll be with American advisors, with relatively small teams of diplomatic, military, and intelligence personnel working with frontline states, in fact, much as they did recently, uh, to fight ISIS. And if you think about advisors, I think you have to think about Ed Lansdale, who is one of the most storied and successful advisors of the 20th century, right up there with T. Lawrence. I think he's got a lot of lessons to teach that are not positive. I mean, he did a lot of things wrong, too. And so what I try to do in the book is to present the good and the bad of Ed Lansdale in a way that I hope will, will be engaged with readers, and I think hopefully will be of some use as we think about uh, the future of American strategy. So thank you for having me here to uh, to talk about it, Peter. Well, Max, thanks for a brilliant presentation of the book. Um, I mean, 
and picking up your last point, um, I mean, all the things that Lansdale did in the Philippines and the Vietnam are all the things that U.S. government officials don't do, essentially. So, I mean, you, you work for General McChrystal uh, when during, doing the assessment in, in Afghanistan, and probably the, the nearest American to get to Karzai was probably General McChrystal, but he didn't get anywhere close to him in the way that Lansdale got close to Ziam and other people. So, I mean, because what you're, in a sense, that one of the big takeaways here is, if you're going to do this, you're probably going to have to spend several years in the country uh, that of, pick your country. You, you probably aren't going to be your family, really, at all, or your children, or your wife. Uh, it's going to be hard. You could develop a new family, though. You could. <laughs> and, of course, you know, the other, you know, one of the, as, as we've discussed, you know, John Paul Van, who was another person who kind of understood, perhaps, uh, how to conduct a war in, Afghan in, in Vietnam, also had a sort of separate family, and um, and is a similar figure, I think, to Lansdale. But I guess the question is, um, you know, we just don't do this sort of thing. I mean, I can't think it was, was, was Ryan Crocker close to Maliki? Uh, who is close to Abadi? I mean, we just, we just, as a country, we just don't seem to do this very well. Uh, and I, hopefully your book will, you know, you know, can remind people that it's really, uh, you know, it's going to be a long process. Yeah, no, I think it is It is something we don't do well, and I think we've paid a price for it, because if you look at our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, we've killed a lot of insurgents in both places and yet struggled to achieve our political objectives. And in one of, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is that we fundamentally screwed up our relationships with Hamid Karzai and Nuri al-Maliki and yeah. got into became locked into very adversarial confrontations with our own allies, much as we did with ZM in the early 1960s after Lansdale departed from Vietnam. And so in both cases, it would have been nice if there had been somebody like an Ed Lansdale, who was this very trusted interlocutor who could deal with them very gently and persuasively. I, I, you know, I think with Karza, actually, I, I would think probably the closest we had that was was probably Zal Khalil Zal, right. who was there for a while, but then, right. of course, he moved on and nobody really replaced him. I don't think we ever really had that with Maliki. And so, I, you know, I think we could use today kind of an army of Ed Lansdales. I mean, it's kind of interesting that the actual army, uh, not the metaphorical army, the, mm. the actual U.S. Army, uh, is uh, standing up something called SFABs, the Security Force Assistance Brigades, uh, the first units dedicated to the advisory mission, which is a great initiative on General Milley's part, and I think long overdue because military advisors have been kind of the bastard stepchildren of the armed forces. So that's great recognition on, that we need military advisors. But my question is, who is providing political advisory work? And in fact, the political advisory mission is ultimately more important because you can teach an army to march and shoot straight and call in airstrikes and all that kind of good stuff. But it really doesn't matter that much if they're working on behalf of a dysfunctional government. And we saw that in the case of Iraq, where the Iraqi army was pretty decent up until 2011, but very quickly fell apart for lack of political leadership thereafter. And so who in the U.S. government really focuses on the political advisory mission? Really hard to see. I mean, occasionally the State Department does it, but it's not really their core view of what they do, and, and their their capacity is, has been devastated uh, under, under uh, Secretary Tillerson. So, you know, I think that this is a, a, a capacity which is really MIA in the U.S. government. And Nadia Shadler, who's a deputy national security advisor, has just written a book kind of with basically with the theory that actually if you're going to have one of these long-term presences, it's actually the military that has the capacity and ability to do this. Uh, and she look, goes back, you know, the, for the last hundred years and looks at the, the various American um, kind of enterprises. And, and, um, and would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think de facto, I think, yes, uh, the military winds up doing it. I mean, this was... I was, you know, at uh, the Army War College in Carlisle, PA recently. I was at the um, Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning. I was at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And in all those places, when, you know, people asked me for advice uh, that would be of use to them, the advice I gave them was focus on politics. Uh, it's not, you're not going to achieve your mission uh, with a narrowly military, and especially not a narrowly military kinetic focus, you have to focus on achieving a, a viable political end state. And, you know, as I said to them, I mean, this is going to make you guys uncomfortable because the military thinks of itself as being apart from politics. And 
Of course, it should remain apart from politics in, in the domestic context, except, of course, when their generals are serving in, in the most senior policy positions in the government. Uh, but aside from that, it should generally stay aloof from politics. But in a foreign context, the military doesn't really have the luxury of saying, we don't, that's outside of our lane, let somebody else do it, because they're looking around for somebody else to do it. They're going to be waiting a long time. Now, that said, I think it would be nice if we would develop more of a civilian capacity to do this. And there are, I would add, I mean, there are sort of Ed Lansdale-like figures that I have met in my travels, and I'm sure you've met too, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Carter Malkazian, this history PhD who worked with the Marines in Afghanistan and Iraq, learned Pashtu, became very close to some of these tribes, or uh, Sarah Chase, who was this former NPR reporter who lived in Kandahar and then became an advisor to U.S. commanders in Kabul. Uh, Thomas Skye, who was this uh, British woman who became advisor to General Odierno in Iraq. So these people do exist, uh, but we don't really cultivate them, and it's often very hard for them uh, to have an impact on the policy debate in Washington, which is something that Lansdale struggled with as well. And I mean, in his case, he often sabotaged himself because one of his paradoxes is that he was very good at cultivating foreign leaders, but he often alienated his own leaders. And his tendency to make more bureaucratic enemies than he could handle ultimately meant that he did not have the influence that he might otherwise have enjoyed. If you have a question, just grab the mic and hit, hit, hit it so it turns green. Dan Roper with, with the Association of the United States Army, and I was the director of the Army's Counterinsurgency Center from 2007 to 2011. And I'm, you, you already nailed the, the main point on the civil mill collaboration and the constant yin-yang, the tension between, okay, if the military is doing it because there aren't civilians there, sometimes there's a perception that, okay, it's mission creep and the military is trying to grow into it when the military in generally desperately wants to be out of it. <laughs> and again, how do we find the mechanism in the Security Force Assistance Brigade is a visible thing that exists. It does, now it's not getting invented to meet the patch chart. So what were the leverage points to try to do what you just said, to try to get the civilian capacity not built into it because then they'll think the military is trying to take state or AID, and they, they, they don't, but they have to represent it. And my concern is now there's a visible U.S. Army formation, a conventional formation, and does that preclude the circumstances of somebody like Lansdale being the unique voice whispering in the decisive person's ear? Is there, is there some mechanism other than that? Because that's, that's baby steps that we should have taken 17 years ago, and we're just getting around to it now. No, well, better late than never. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, I don't have the answers, but I think we can, I mean, it would be nice if there was some creative thinking about this, about, you know, Maybe there's some way to use, I haven't really thought about this, but maybe there's some way uh, to make, use the kind of the SFAB construct and make it more than strictly an army thing, more than a military thing, to work in civilians, whether from other government agencies or from outside the government, to use that uh, kind of support infrastructure uh, to, to, to make use of them as well. I mean, another idea that I've heard bandied about, for example, is, uh, you know, maybe in, in some of the COCOMs, the ones that don't have uh, major wars like uh, CENTCOM, like for, so for example, SOUTHCOM, maybe that should be commanded by a civilian rather than a military uh, uh, general, and maybe the general should be the deputy and the civilian should be in charge. But I mean, basically ways to, you know, try to think about how to use the, the military backbone, because they have the infrastructure and the, and the capacity to try to get more civilians involved uh, at a practical and useful level, just on the assumption that the State Department is just never going to have the resources to mirror what the what the uh, what the military is doing. Uh, so I think these are all things that are worth thinking about. Of course, as we're thinking about them, we can acknowledge the fact that you know the State Department is losing a generation of talent right now. Morale uh, is is through the floor there, and uh, so it's very hard to you know uh, assert any soft power uh, in in the current climate. Yeah, it's part of the problem that the United States has. A about thinking of itself as an empire, and that therefore won't, even though that we have, you know, obviously Lansdale was sort of, I mean, Philippines was part of the American empire, and that we won't do the things that are required if to run an empire, i.e. live places, learn languages, these kinds of things. Part of it is a sort of ideological problem where we're going to be in a place for six months because we're not an occupying power, uh, and then we find that we're in Afghanistan 17 years later. Um, is part of this just our 
the way that we can self-conceptualize why we constantly get this, you know, with some honorable exceptions, we usually get this wrong in some shape or form. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've written for a while that I think we're, uh, you know, kind of an empire in denial, not a traditional yeah. empire, but kind of a liberal empire. Uh, and, or, you know, alternatively, you can put it, uh, another way to put it is to say we're uh, a nation builder in denial, uh, yeah. a country that never wants to engage in nation building. And you kind of wonder how things might have turned out differently in Afghanistan uh, if we hadn't come in there with the mindset that we were going to leave in six months. If we, in fact, in 2001, 2002, people actually had the mindset, well, we're going to be here 20 years from now. Let's figure out how to, how to make things so that they'll work 20 years from now. That was never our mindset. And so it makes it very hard to achieve long-term results when you have a very short-term mindset. And this is a, you know, a bipartisan affliction because probably one of the very few things that Barack Obama and Donald Trump would agree on is that nation building begins at home. They're both very hostile to the idea of nation building, which has gotten a bad odor, I think, because it's associated with the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the irony, of course, is that the invasion of Iraq turned into a disaster in large part because we didn't do any preparation for <laughs> nation building. Uh, but, you know, the kind of nation building that I have in mind doesn't involve hundreds of thousands of troops. It's really uh, Wednesdale's type missions uh, with fairly small advisory teams, which has been successful in places like El Salvador and more recently in Colombia. Mm. And I think it's a model that can work, but it really depends on having people who know the local culture, the local people, and who don't rotate in and out every six months, who really uh, can build relationships and sustain relationships of trust, which is very hard to do with the personnel and, and, and bureaucratic policies of the U.S. government. Um, uh, <clears throat> Marvin Ott, Johns Hopkins, Wilson Center, formerly uh, U.S. government, uh, defense, CIA, and various other poor call. Uh, one quick comment and then a question. Uh, a comment just apropos the civilian military sharing of the burden and division of labor and so on. I think all the, all the points that have been made are right on the money. I really like the empire in denial. I think that's a great phrase. Uh, it, it does strike me. I spent the last 20 years before retiring a professor at the National War College and so became deeply steeped in that curriculum. And as you know, as you know, I mean, this is a civilian military enterprise, and there is a consistent effort to instill in the uniformed services exactly the kind of sort of governance, civilian part of the burden. Uh, so there's a real effort to sensitize and, and even, even educate the military in that mode. And I'll just note, among the students I had in seminar was one Jim Mattis, mm -hmm. then Colonel Mattis, Marine Corps. I took him on a trip to Southeast Asia. Uh, he's a guy who got it, and he's not alone. I mean, there's a, it's a minority, but there's a, a distinct sort of stream of folks that come out of the War College and other JME institutions that do under, that, that get that. Um, so that's the comment. The, the quick, the sort of, basically a question. Uh, back to the history of Vietnam, uh, I was in Vietnam in the early 60s. It was on the state desk when Xiem coup occurs. Um, at the time, I thought I was steeped in sort of the counterinsurgency romance and lore and Green Berets and JFK and all that. And I was, and we talked with Roger Hillsman, he was assistant secretary. I was convinced that Xiem, you just couldn't do it. I mean, as Hillsman said, can you win with Xiem? Big question. And I thought the answer was no. So I take your point about the 58,000 casualties, all of that, but I just wonder, you know, with the best will in the world, Lansdale was all his skills, Z whether Zian was a hopeless case. Well, that's, I mean, what, what you're saying was certainly the uh, conventional wisdom at the time in the press corps, and obviously within the government, that's why the decision was made to back this military coup. And it has remained largely, I would say, kind of the, the received uh, interpretation. I mean, if you watch the Ken Burns Vietnam series, uh, it has Neil Sheehan talking about uh, ZM and various others talking about how he'd lost popular support and legitimacy uh, by 1963. Uh, but there's a paradox here because uh, if ZM was, was such a terrible and unpopular ruler, why is it that once he was overthrown, the situation actually got worse rather than better? And that's something that... What? Well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's well, that's exactly, and I think in hindsight it's pretty obvious that 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 uh, you could do worse than ZM. That he was actually as as 
Lansdale said uh, in, in 63, uh, the best alternative that we had, that we didn't have anybody better, and certainly the generals were not going to be better. Lansdale was convinced, and a lot of other people were convinced too. I mean, uh, Rostow subsequently said that, uh, you know, our last chance to avoid Americanizing the war in Vietnam was to send Ed Lansdale over there in 1963 because he thought that Lansdale was the only person who could have pushed us aside, no din nu, uh, uh, ZM spiritorial uh, fascist brother, uh, and, and convinced uh, ZM to conciliate the Buddhists uh, and to act in a less authoritarian, high-handed fashion because ZM trusted Lansdale and he didn't really trust any other Americans. But Lansdale could not get over there in 63 because by that point he had too many bureaucratic enemies at the State Department, at DOD, at the CIA. He did not have a lot of friends in government by that point. Uh, and so he was blocked from going over there, and ZM was overthrown. And again, it's, it, it made the situation much worse. And in addition to destabilizing South Vietnam, it also Americanized the war because it kind of gave us ownership of the situation in South Vietnam because we'd overthrown their ruler. And so we took mm -hmm. responsibility for the fate of South Vietnam, and that's what set us on the path to half a million troops. Jeff Stein, who was an intelligence officer in Vietnam back in the day. Yeah, thanks. Nice to uh, meet you, yeah, uh, great to Max, see you. finally in yeah. person. Enjoy reading your writing. Uh, I love your book. Uh, I think you've got a lot of really salient points, but I'm very skeptical about this idea of uh, that we've talked about in the last uh, few minutes about, you know, turning armed forces into advisors and so on. Uh, it prompted me to recall uh, what Bob Kaiser, who became managing editor of the Washington Post, but in 1968 and 69, he was a correspondent in Vietnam for the Post. And when I was doing my own Vietnam book, he gave me his diary. It was a very generous thing. And one of his entries was, we have advisors at every level in Vietnam, and when we are the ones that are the advisors. Um, you know, I, I, I spent a year in language school before I went to Vietnam. Uh, and then I worked as a case officer, living on the economy um, for a year. And I maybe under, began to understand Vietnam at the end of my year. Um, so the idea that you can take sort of ordinary, like infantry officers and troops, uh, psychological warfare people, language training, uh, and of course, Pashto and other languages like that, extraordinarily difficult. I mean, Vietnamese is pretty difficult. but. Uh, uh, it's, uh, anyway, early when pressure did just bang off my ear. They don't. They don't go in. Uh, I, I, I'm just really skeptical about this idea of turning uh, troops into advisors, overnight advisors, and telling who are they going to advise and what are they going to tell um, the you know ordinary Afghan uh, village and tribal leaders and so on. What have they got to tell them? Well, I mean, I, I think your, your skepticism was well warranted, of course. You know, part of the reason why Lansdale was effective was because he was not just there for a one-year tour. I mean, he spent something like six years in Vietnam, so he really got the lay of the land, even though, I mean, he was handicapped by not having the language capability. Uh, but, uh, but he, you know, you know, he became friends with a wide variety of Vietnamese and kind of integrated into Vietnamese society greater than most folks do in the course of a one-year deployment. Uh, and like but, you say, we've got the fair chases and so yeah, on. Right. Uh, there are some people who do this kind of thing today who are, you know, typically outside of the normal military structure. Uh, but even with the military advisors, I would say they can be pretty darn useful, even if they're not doing advising per se. My, my model here is the 1972 Easter Offensive, uh, where we had only a few, we, you know, as you know, we'd taken out our combat troops by that point. We had a few thousand advisors. Uh, and they actually performed a very important role because when you think about the ARVIN, you know, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, uh, as you, you go, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you were there, I wasn't, but, uh, you know, they, they had some, some, you know, good troops who were certainly willing to fight for the state of South Vietnam. Uh, I think a lot of problems, like any other military force, I mean, as the, as the old saying goes, you know, they're, they're no bad soldiers, only bad officers. Uh, you know, their, their problems had to do with kind of the corruption, favoritism, and, and all these other problems within the officer corps, much like in Iraq or Afghanistan or what have you. And I think the few thousand American advisors performed a vital role in 1972, which was that they basically provided the leadership that the Arvin needed and often did not get from their own officers. And so you had people like John Paul Van directing the defense of the Central Highlands and doing it very effectively, calling in, Amer of course, they also had American air power. And so that's another thing. Just like today in Afghanistan and Iraq, advisors are the key links that allow the use of American air power, but do it very effectively. Uh, and so 
you know, that relatively small number of advisors actually, I think, uh, saved South Vietnam in 1972. And potentially, if we had kept the, the advisors and kept the air power, might have been able to save South Vietnam in 1975. Uh, but, you know, there was that overriding weakness within the, the South Vietnamese government of, you know, of their aloofness, corruption, aptitude, and so forth. And these were all things that they had identified in the 60s and said, you know, we need to want it. He was trying to promote more reformist generals uh, who would be more honest and less corrupt. And he just got no traction in either Saigon or Washington because nobody on our side cared about that kind of stuff. They thought that we would just, you know, use ma you know, uh, massive firepower and blast the, uh, the insurgents into oblivion. But he was very worried about what the long-term fate of this, uh, of this country would be with this kind of illegitimate, corrupt, aloof military dictatorship. And uh, that ultimately proved part of their undoing, I would say. We have one more question, and then Max will sign books. Uh, John Vrolick, separated uh, Marine Infantry Officer. Um, <clears throat> to what extent do you think the U.S. can avoid the negative connotations, or contamination even, of a political advisor to a candidate? Certainly, Magsaysay -Say was successful, but the U.S. didn't have quite the same flavor of U.S. influence or U.S. imperialism. Um, I spent three months in Vietnam back in 2007 working for the State Department, and much of the communist propaganda still refers to Diem and so forth as the running dogs and so forth of the Americans, and that was a big selling point there. Um, but especially if we think today in an Islamic society, uh, to what extent does having a U.S. political advisor necessarily just immediately lose that candidate their legitimacy? And if, that, if we keep that in mind, is it worth having covert political advisors, and is that a workable solution, kind of as you see it? Well, I mean, those are all legitimate issues, and those were even issues in the Philippines in the early 50s, uh, where Mog Sai Sai political opponents tried to paint him as, as the lackey of Washington, who was being manipulated uh, by his American advisor, Colonel Lansdale. It didn't actually work so well in the Philippines, because Filipinos, uh, at least at that time, were pretty pro-American. And so Mog Sai Sai basically said, yeah, you know, the Americans support me. That's great. And that actually it didn't hurt him. It helped him. Obviously, in other parts of the world, it's, it's, it's a greater issue. Uh, and it has to be managed sensitively. Uh, and there is, I mean, obviously there is a lot of Amer anti-Americanism out there and probably a lot more now than there was uh, prior to November of 2016. Uh, and so that doesn't help the cause uh, because, you know, if you're an American envoy, you're associated with the president, uh, which is a pretty heavy rock to carry in your ruck. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think it's a mission impossible. I think it has to be managed because even though obviously there is resentment and anybody who's seen as, as you know, kind of the client of the United States is, is going to, there's going to be some backlash and resentment, but there is also some positive connotations with that. There's also an era of power that we have had uh, where, you know, uh, people gain strength from their association with us and often, in fact, you know, play on, on their client relationship with us to manipulate local politics in their favor, kind of using our power to vanquish local rivals. Uh, and so, and you know, it's, I, I, you know, we're, I, I think we're kind of treated with a mixture of resentment and admiration, and there's all this complex mix of emotions. Uh, but in most countries, it's not like anybody who's associated with the Americans. That's the kiss of death. Um, it's, I think, it's a much more complex issue. And uh, you know, we certainly have representation in all these countries. We have military missions in all these countries. And so, it's not really a question of whether we have. Uh, diplomats and, and military personnel and intelligence officers. I mean, we, we got all that stuff. The question is, you know, how are they conducting themselves? Uh, what are they doing? And it's kind of interesting in the case of Vietnam, because Lansdale was, a, was on loan to the CIA. He was a very unconventional CIA guy uh, who didn't really believe in agency tradecraft, and the agency didn't really believe in what he was doing. So as soon as he left Vietnam at the end of 56, uh, they the CIA kind of went back to business as usual. There was nobody who replaced them as an advisor to ZM because nobody at Lang, well, it wasn't Langley at that time. It was, they were actually headquartered in, in town here. But nobody in the CIA thought that was an important function to perform. Uh, and instead, they went back to their comfort zone, which was hiring a cleaning woman in the presidential palace to steal the president's waste paper basket and take the contents mm -hmm. to the station for analysis. Uh, now, Lan Lansdale thought this was ridiculous because he didn't need to steal ZM's trash to figure out what he was doing. He would just go see ZM, and he was friends with ZM, and ZM would tell him what was going on. And so he had this different, he didn't really believe in these controlled agent relationships. He just believed in friendship and empathy and winning people over. And I, and I have to believe that's still not impossible, uh, but that's, 
that's kind of not our mindset. We, we have a different approach to things. One more quick question. Do you think force protection, which is basically trumps everything else for the State Department and the U.S. military now, sort of damages the ability to do the things that Lansdale did? You know, when you use that word, you have to pay a royalty to the Trump Organization now. Little, little known law that was just passed. <laughs> uh, yeah, force protection, I would say, is probably a greater impediment today than it was in Lansdale's day, because as those of you who are in Vietnam can attest, force protection rules were a lot looser then than they are now. But again, I, I mean, you can you can you can finesse these things. Uh, you you can still operate, and lots of people in Afghanistan and Iraq have ignored the very strict force protection requirements. Yeah. Well, thank you, Max. I was really thank you. Thank you. We share an agent.